You might want to sit down for this one. Jordan Peterson handed the most lethal weapon to every man on Earth, and it's not what you think it is. I believe this conversation with Chris Williamson allowed Jordan to unravel the layers to many of his controversial opinions in the past, and one of them happens to be his call for young men to learn to be dangerous. You'll leave this video a very different person to what you started, so watch this clip before we get into it. You said that a harmless man is not a good man. A good man is a very dangerous man who has that under voluntary control. How should people become more dangerous? Oh, becoming more articulate is definitely, I would say, that's the primary array of weapons. So, I mean, physical prowess is something, and, and it's not nothing, that physical confidence that comes along with that as well. But the same thing replicated at the level of the ability to communicate and to think um, that's a way broader field of of battle and opportunity so this is one thing that isn't taught well especially to boys um, it's more important to teach it to boys i would say because they're more uh skeptical of such of the educational enterprise in general generally speaking partly because they're less obedient partly because they're less agreeable that's particularly true for disagreeable boys. And agreeable boys get higher grades independent of their IQ and their, and their academic achievement because they're easier to deal with. So what do you tell disagreeable boys? There's nothing that makes you more formidable than verbal competence, than being able to articulate, be able to think, to marshal your arguments, right? It's a battlefield metaphor to get everything in order. Get all your information straight you know, to marshal your forces. And so, I mean, that's part of the reason that rap artists are so popular, especially among disaffected young men, black and white alike, because they're unbelievably articulate. Like they have this incredible verbal prowess. It's unbelievably attractive. You know, and it's associated with genuine artistic um, and redemptive activity, often focusing on something that's approximately the voice of the underclass, let's say, but a powerful voice, right? And it's interesting to see how many young white guys identify with that. Was it Aldous Huxley that wrote Doors of Perception? Yeah. Yeah, so this is kind of an equivalent of that, right? That you have a experience which many people struggle to articulate. You take the best of us, the one that has the most precise, most articulate mm -hmm. erudite language, mm -hmm. You drop them in and you say, okay, show us what you've learned. Mm -hmm. This is the equivalent, but for just a different community, a different sort of life, mm -hmm. that maybe you don't have the ability to describe what it feels like to live on a council estate in Manchester or in you know, the, one of the neighborhoods of Brooklyn or whatever it might be. And then this person can. Mm -hmm. And it feels like it's your voice. I remember when the New York Times called Jordan Peterson the quote, custodian of patriarchy. It used exactly this call by Jordan for men to be quote, dangerous as a means for him to supposedly shore up the patriarchy. But even before I explore Jordan Peterson's true conception of being dangerous, there's a quote by him that I believe perfectly encapsulates this idea. He said, and I quote, if you think strong men are dangerous, wait till you see what weak men are capable of. That hits the nail on the head for me because think about it. Imagine for a second the most dangerous kind of man that exists in this society today and ask yourself if they're strong. Do you think the person that shoots up a school or harbors hateful ideas in the cover of the crowd is a strong man? Or is he a terribly weak man making up for his sheer resentment, insecurity, and anger and taking it out on the rest of society? It's clearly the latter because true weakness resembles a void. It is the void left by strength and principles where even the worst manifestations of strength start to become attractive. And that's such a perfect segue to Jordan's conception of strength. At the root of all kinds of strength lies a clarity of mind and speech. Even if you imagine a leader in history that has left the greatest mark and inspired the largest revolutions, it's the power to influence minds through speech that snowballs into an unstoppable movement over time. In the civil rights movement, for example, people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X were just individuals, but the established political and societal order of the time saw them as very dangerous men for the status quo. Simply because of the revolution they inspired by igniting a fire in the minds of millions using their words, 
Their ability to articulate a case was the most dangerous thing about them. But you don't even have to conceptualize speech on such a grand scale to be able to appreciate its power. The ability to chip through ideas, communicate them, and get people on your side is the closest thing to a superpower that you can get in real life, and that speaks to a lot more things about humans than just communicating ideas. If there truly is an instinct for art inside of us, then the power of speech takes on artistic forms with things like music and poetry. If you're a young man, you still feel alienated from your place as rightful heir of the proper kingdom. I mean, that's an existential truism for everyone, for every, particularly for every young man, because he is an outsider in many ways. He's young and juvenile and not very highly valued and, and then is, is in some sense, hurt by the inadequacies of the current king, the current culture, and, and is easily turned against it because of that. And that's the machinations of the evil uncle. That's the King Arthur story. That's the story of Horus, Hor Horus and Osiris. It's an ancient, ancient story. It's the story of Sauron, and um, it's there all the time. And you see in that, in rap music, in hip hop, the, the, all of that alienation being given an articulated voice in, in an artistic sense. And that's a good example of the power of verbal facility. And that's the route to, let's say, marketing education to young men. It's like, you wanna, you wanna take your rightful place in the kingdom? It's like, get your tongue straight, man. Get it under control in the highest possible sense. We went to a comedy club, Tammy and I, and in uh, New York, the Comedy Cellar. It's a great comedy club. And the last comic was an English guy. And uh, he was uh, not particularly physically prepossessing, and he, he made a lot of jokes about that. And it was quite funny. And then he divided the audience into five sections, and he asked each section to toss up a topic, just to yell out a topic. And they were like random topics like the Kennedy assassination and electric lighting before 1890. Those were two of the topics. And the other three were just as diverse. And then he put on some beats, and... He did a, about an eight minute rap with every verse rhymed and he tied the whole thing together at the end and ended at the end of the music all spontaneously. It was unbelievable. And that's Logos, man. That's the redemptive power of the Logos right there. The magic word, the sacred word. It's just manifesting itself on stage. There's something Very that, impressive. Something about that that does feel dangerous as well. In, not in a... I need to be concerned and this should be contaminated and walled off, but in a way that you think that person has so much competence mm -hmm. that it, it's flowing out of them mm -hmm. and you almost feel competent by being around them. Mm -hmm. so but you certainly feel competent by appreciating it, yep. right? Because it speaks to the part of you that is capable of appreciating such things. You think, wow, that's really something. That's really, that's an amazing display. That's an amazing thing to see. Amazing, right? A very interesting word, amazing. And you're, you're trapped and you're trapped by the charisma of that. And that charisma, that's not nothing. That's, that's a signal of something redemptive occurring. That, that accounts for virtually all of the attraction of hip hop and rap. And you know another way speech and music can intertwine? Well, there's a really interesting phenomenon that studies how some people have a heightened prosody which is a combination of the rhythm, tone, and cadence of speakers that almost sets the audience into a state of trance. It's musical to the ears, all while engaging people with the content of what is being said. That's the superpower that many of the greatest orators across history have employed, from people like Abraham Lincoln to Martin Luther King Jr. Try to imagine it as a more subtle form of poetry and music that embeds itself into everyday speech, which some people develop a grasp over time. And I would argue that it's the most important soft skill that people can learn today. In a world where entire economies and cultures are becoming part of a large global village, how can anyone expect to make progress without the power to get their point across? Recent studies have even revealed how the average American adult in the last few decades has actually declined in their vocabulary from the 1970s to the 2010s. Doesn't that sound paradoxical in a world that is more connected and virtualized than ever? It reveals just how wrong American colleges and universities are going, depriving students the opportunity to master language as the most potent tool in everything from their relationships to their businesses in life, because that's what truly makes a dangerous man. 
He's dangerous because he's competitive, and he's dangerous because he can get people behind him. In fact, if you understand from an evolutionary perspective how a primitive form of language helped human species diverge from primate ancestors, the power of speech becomes abundantly clear. Because here's the greatest power that humans have over animal species. We learn cumulatively. When one member learns something new, say for example how to chisel a rock into a sharp tool, that knowledge gets passed on to the other members of the tribe through language and memorization. Those members then build upon it instead of each of them having to learn everything from the ground up by themselves. Naturally, the most powerful individual is one that has the most value to give in this regard, and this is a truth that even holds true today in modern human society. That verbal prowess is one of the ways they struggle up towards the light, you know, and, and that, that's a good example of that, uh, of having that danger under control, because it's a dark genre in many ways, right? It's, it's a, there's a, there's a, there's a real undercurrent, an air of violence that surrounds that and its culture, like the punk movement in the, in, in, in the UK back in the late seventies, same, same sort of thing. But that, that capacity to express that in a poetic manner, in a compelling manner, Sid, or uh, Johnny Rotten was great at that. He was so intense. He has a song called Rise, which I used to show my, my clients all the time when I was starting uh, a, uh, assertiveness training with them. I'd put on Johnny Rotten's rise and the line in there is anger is an energy and he's got these unbelievably intense eyes anger is an energy you bet and john lydon man he could channel that like almost no one i've ever seen he'd get that anger built up inside him and then it was completely under control and he expressed it in his music and he's absolutely captivating unbelievably charismatic and i really liked his music that raw anger in the music that but it was it was in the bloody music wasn't it, it wasn't some random riot you know he transmuted that into something, you know, you can argue about the poetic merits of, um, of punk rock, although I don't think you should. I mean, uh, I did it my way, Sid Vicious's version of I did it my way. My God, that's a work of genius, that. It's so, it's so brilliantly satirical. What someone's doing is they're refining it, they're distilling it yeah. down, and then they're directing it. So I went to a, a powerlifting competition a couple of years ago. There was this one guy there lifting. He holds a bunch of records in the squat. And he's a, a normal working class guy from a normal working class town on the outskirts of Newcastle. And watching that man warm up is something else. Mm -hmm. He's got a, a sacred playlist. Mm -hmm. He never listens to the songs apart from when he's about to step on to the lifting platform. Mm -hmm. and he's got these headphones on and he's just walking up and down in the same way that you'd see a bull mm -hmm. ready, ready to go out, ready to go and chase something. And he steps out on stage and the hairs stand up on the back of your mm -hmm, neck. Mm -hmm. You're watching this guy channel Rage. fury. That's the god of war. That's Mars. Yeah, he's in touch with that. Mm. Unbelievable. And words, man. You go to war with words. And you think that's what young men should be taught. That's the most powerful lesson that any man can learn today. I think that there's another element to being articulate and speaking well that isn't often talked about. And that is just how cathartic it is. When you feel like you've truly done justice to your thoughts while putting them together in sentences, it gives you a degree of satisfaction that does away with the resentment from bottling up what you truly want to say. Unfortunately, that's the state that describes most people today to the point that they've forgotten the true depth and dynamism of the language they speak. For someone like Jordan Peterson himself, I think it's easy to say that his impeccable ability to speak and to engage with people with his words is what has helped him amass a following in the millions. And it's a truism of the modern world that articulate speech is what will also make you the most powerful force today.